Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Oh, excellent. I feel like we could, we could actually go home now and I would have gained a huge blessing. And I just thank the musicians for their music this morning, um, especially that song during offering. It was um, very special because um, God is our all in all, isn't he? Do you have a favorite sport? I yes, some say yes straight away, some nod their heads, some sort of gone into that thinking mode. What would you define as sport? And to save you trying to come up with an explanation, I looked in the dictionary. And sport is an activity for exercise, pleasure, or competition, or the enjoyment game gained from a pastime. So now knowing the definition, do you have a favorite sport? You should all be saying yes. Surely you have things that you enjoy, and I know there's some people here who like gardening, some people here who like walking or running, some people here like teaching, some people here like water skiing, motorbike riding, four-wheel driving. Who enjoyed going on the Discovery Day? Surely you enjoyed that. It's exploring. You all have a pastime, you all have a sport and a hobby. Am I correct? I'm starting to get a few more nods. It's not time for sleep just yet. <laughs> so we've ascertained that we've all got a sport. I know I have, I have plenty, different, different things I really enjoy doing, some more than others, and I never get to do them enough. What would you say is God's sport? Now, we could probably be here all day debating this. And looking through the scripture... I've come to the conclusion that God really enjoys something. Above, maybe above, that really stands out to me anyway. This is my, what I gain from the scripture. And I guess God probably loves creating things. And they say, we were watching a, a DVD last night about space and how big it is. And they say there's a new star created every second in space somewhere. So God probably loves creating. Well, he created us, didn't he? Created this world. I'll talk a little bit about that a bit later on. And I guess he likes visiting his worlds that he has created, that, that he's able to communicate with one-to-one, face-to-face, ones that haven't fallen. But I think we have a special spot in God's heart. And I think, for me, God's sport is wrestling. So sorry you out there were thinking it was football or car racing or, or, or anything else. You know, I've had my fair share of wrestling, and I'm just going to tell you a little story. I used to drive trucks in Australia, and it was long distance truck driving, and there wasn't a lot of sleep involved usually, and I remember this one particular journey I was travelling. I left Brisbane on a Sunday, Sunday evening, Sunday night, and I had to go down to Grafton, which is about four hours from Brisbane, empty, go down, load sugar, and then take the sugar through to Sydney. And you expect it to be in Sydney and first thing Monday morning, half past six if you can, or six o'clock, be at the place to unload before the traffic starts. No problem, got there. Then spent all day Monday, so that was no sleep Sunday night. They spent all day Monday unloading and then finding getting another load. And I actually had to go down to Wollongong, which is another sort of close enough to two hours past Sydney, going down the down the coast, and got another load of steel there. Loaded up and then and if you get loaded before 5 o'clock, they expect you to be back in Brisbane 7 o'clock the next morning. Now, Brisbane to Sydney is about 12, 12 and a half hours driving. So I left Newcastle about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And so by the time you get back to Sydney, through Sydney, through peak hour, and then head on up, and i back in Brisbane again at half past 7, 8 o'clock in the next morning. Hadn't had a lot of, lot of sleep, probably 5 or 10 minutes here or there. Now, a big fear with driving for me, when I'm driving trucks, there's a couple of fears I have. One is that I fall asleep at the wheel. Another fear is that you run off the road or have an accident and hurt people. And the third fear is that you're probably going to do some damage to the truck. Because when you're a truck driver, that's your pride and joy, is your, the truck that you're driving. So, and I'm very focused on falling asleep at the wheel. I only ever done it once, and that was here, not even driving a truck. Um, but anyway, this 
are very focused on it and I refuse to take drugs. Most truck drivers in Australia are taking drugs or some sort of something to stay awake. And it progresses, it starts with something that's non-harmful usually and then it slowly gets worse and worse until they're on LSD or some real heavy drugs to try and stay awake and eventually that wears off too and they have all sorts of repercussions. Anyway, this particular day, gone back into Brisbane and then there was a load from Brisbane to go to Melbourne. So we're at Tuesday morning and it's, Melbourne is 18 hours driving away. So when you, when you leave Melbourne, you've, I mean, when you leave Brisbane, you've got to, especially that late in the week, you've got to try and work it out that you're going to get to Melbourne get, and get back to Brisbane before the weekend, before Friday night. So anyway, you spend all day Tuesday unloading and loading up again. And if you leave Melbourne before 8 o'clock on, on a night, they expect you generally to be unloaded the next day in Melbourne. So if you can do the maths with that, there's not a lot of time for, for resting. So anyway, this particular day, left um, Brisbane and headed out. You go out to Gundawindi, which is about four hours. And by now it was about 10 or 11 o'clock this one particular night. And, and in Australia, they have rest areas every now and again. And, um, and there's a sign that comes up and will say, rest area, 20 kilometres ahead. And that doesn't sound far. In Australia, that's it. it's not far at all. But I tell you what, when you're tired, 20 kilometres takes a long time to roll around when you're in a truck. And this particular night, I came, came along and I was out heading toward Narrabri and, it, and there was a rest area and I knew it was ahead there. So, and I was feeling really weary because I hadn't had sleep for about two and a half days. And, uh, and the rest area came up, so I pulled in, and I was really, really tired. And, and when you ever get to a rest area with a truck, a truck, you always go to the far end of it, if, because in half an hour you can have 20 trucks in a rest area, and sometimes you can't get out. So this particular time I made my way, there was only two other trucks in there, so I made my way right to the far end of the rest area and sort of stopped. Now with a truck with a big diesel engine, you've got to let it wind down and let the turbo wind down before you just turn it off. So this particular day, night, I was that tired, and so while I'm waiting for the truck to wind down, I put my head on the steering wheel, because that's what happens. When, you, when you're that tired, and there's three types of having a sleep when you're in a truck long distance driving. There's the one where you hop into the bed, because the trucks all have a bed in them, so that's one, one type of sleep, and you'll probably, if you're tired, you go in there and you won't come out for three hours or four hours, because you're that tired, you can't wake up. The other one is you get a pillow and put on the steering wheel and put your head on there, and that'll give you half an hour to an hour, and then you usually get too uncomfortable. If you really want a short one, you just put your head straight on the steering wheel, because you can only last for like 10 minutes like this, and then you've got to wake up. So this particular night I come in, and while I'm waiting for the truck to wind down, I was like this. And I, you remember I'm really tired, so I'm just, the truck's still idling away. And next thing I woke up, and I hadn't even turned the lights off on the truck, so I got the and, and you've got plenty of lights on the trucks in Australia, big lights. I've got about a thousand watts of lights on the truck and like everything in front of you is like daylight. And as I come to like this, here's these trees not even to the end of that wall away from me with all the lights shining. So I'm on the brakes and trying to get that truck to slow down and, and then I realised I was stopped. <laughs> Needless to say, I did not have to have any sleep from that point on and I actually got to within two hours of Melbourne. <laughs> Just the adrenaline. I tell you what, I got the biggest fright of my life that night when I woke up and, realized, and finally figured out that I was actually stopped, I was stationary, and the truck was still idling away, but it was just that moment when you open your eyes and see that I for a moment thought I was running off the road. And I tell you what, it's scary. Um, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you will just guide my thoughts and my words, Lord. May each person here gain a blessing from what you have given to me. And Lord, may we leave here with something that we can use in our lives. I thank you and praise your wonderful name. Amen. You're probably thinking, what in the world has sport and that got to do with, with the scripture reading? Well, generally, if we've grown up in a church or in a, have, a, have a Christian upbringing, we generally know the stories in the Bible. And the stories, I think, lose their meaning. The story of Noah. It's like the Titanic. We know what happens in the end. It sort of loses its emphasis. So that's why the scripture reading this morning was the story ending. Just to put some people, if they're not sure of how the story ended, it ends good. So you can, you can relax. The story is of Jacob. Now Jacob had a bit of a, well, maybe a reputation, but he was known. What did his name mean? Or another name? Deceiver? Jacob 
was, as it turns out by nature, a deceiver. Who did he deceive in his life? His father? His brother? Because he deceived his brother first, and then his father, what had to happen with Jacob? He had to, he had to leave home, big time, and in a rush. So Jacob split the gap and went over to a, into another country and met who there? He met one of his in-laws. Isn't that, that's pretty, pretty cool, isn't it? To go to somewhere far away country and you actually meet up with an in-law. Now his in-law, in a bonus additive, his in-law had some pretty nice daughters. So that just worked in really nice. Now, then what happened to the deceiver? He got deceived. And that's a real mean trick. <laughs> How would you be? You uh, pull the veil up and it's, oh, it's your sister, uh, your bride's sister. So then he has to work for seven years for his bride, and then he got deceived, so then he had to work for another seven years. And then he works for another big amount of time, and he's starting to hear things from the Laban's herdsman, because Laban was his father-in-law saying about how Jacob was stealing all, his, all the flocks and everything that owned to them, he was acquiring it. Was he acquiring it deceitfully or truthfully? Truthfully. Yeah, God was blessing him and blessing him majorly. Everything that, whatever agreement they had, God blessed Jacob and his flocks and herds grew and grew. So it came time and, and God actually talked to Jacob and said, Jacob, it's time to leave. It's time to go home. Now, the spirit of, spirit of prophecy tells us that he would have left long before this time, except that if he, he knew that if he was going to go home, he had to face his brother. So it, it held him there, I guess, for a while. But in the end, God told him, it's time to leave. So when he left, do you think he was full of joy? Or he was a bit apprehensive? I would think he'd be very apprehensive. But God told him to leave. You know, sometimes we face in life, and, and I'm sure God tells us to, to do certain things, and maybe we're a bit apprehensive about it. There's a little promise I found in Joshua 1.5. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So he leaves, he leaves Laban, and he's off, and he wa wastes a lot opportune time when Laban's not around. He gets, gets out in the two days out, and then Laban realizes that, oh, all the family's gone. I didn't even get to say goodbye. So he's after him. And they, they finally catch up with each other and, and, and he, Jacob nearly gets deceived by his wife and actually nearly loses her because Laban was really angry because on, on top of just leaving, someone had taken his prized gods or idols and unbeknown to everyone, Rachel had them and she was sitting on them and and. Jacob didn't even know and said to Laban, if you can find them, you can, you can kill the person or take them. So he nearly lost his prized wife. It's funny how things go in full circles, isn't it? So anyway, they, they had the time there together and then it was time to leave. And, and as Jacob's leaving, or as they, as they separate and they made an agreement not to go past a certain point to cross over, and as Jacob's leaving, once again, God shows that he's with him. His angels are... are encamped around them and, and move with them. And another little promise is Psalm 34, 7. The angel of the Lord encamps, encamps around those who fear him. God was with them. Is God with us? Is God with us? Amen. God is with us. So now he's really starting to, to think because he's getting close to the border of, the, of, the, of his homeland. So he decides, what am I going to do? I know my brother's still around. Maybe I should send a message. That's what I'll do. I'll send a message. And in Genesis 32, if you want to follow along a little bit, we'll be jumping around a little bit, but Genesis 32, he sends a message to Esau. I'm coming back home, and I have lots of, lots of possessions. And, I'm, and his whole reasoning behind it was he didn't want, to, didn't want to pose a threat, I guess, to Esau. And it wasn't long and the, and the servants came back. Esau is coming. I can imagine Jacob thinking, oh, choice, my brother's coming to see me. 
Yep, he's coming all right, and he's got 400 men. Oh, choice, big party, 400, 400 men. Back then when they mentioned 400 men, it wasn't just because it was a big welcoming party. 400 men represented a, a good-sized army. These were desert warriors, battle-hardened, ready for action. Now Jacob was terrified. Here's a band of an army, small army, coming to, to deal with his family. And that's basically all it was. It was a big family. There was no, they hadn't trained for fighting. They hadn't done anything. They were basically just a family with a big flock and a big herds. In verse 7 of Genesis chapter 32, straight away, Jacob goes into this like panic mode. Right, we need to split, split everything in half. Split the herds in half. We need to separate them up because he's coming. So we need to sort of minimize our chances, I guess. So we'll split all the herds in half. Well, actually, we'll split the families as well and split everyone in half. Because if he attacks one, maybe the others can get away. Isn't it funny how we have immediate responses sometimes? We go into panic mode and we have our immediate response. Then he, he must, I guess, sort of calm down a little bit. And then he goes into and has a, has a prayer with God. It's a recorded prayer. And it's interesting to note that this is actually the first recorded prayer since he left Bethel, where's the, the vision of the ladder, climbing Jacob's ladder. Um, this was the first time we have a recorded prayer. And it goes through and he, he, he's reminding God of, of what God's done for him and, and how he's promised him that he will, he will be a, a great nation. And, but you know what? All through that, in the scripture anyway, it doesn't record God responding. God is quiet. How often do we seek God or, or want an answer and we, and we, we are genuine? But we don't get a response. It seems that we don't get a response. God is quiet. So he's back into to thinking, well, I've got to solve this problem, and um, I'm not getting any response here. So I know in verse 13, he says, I'll send some gifts. I'll select some gifts. I have plenty. I can, I can give some gifts. So he chooses, he looks around his herds, because back then, I'm not sure how you'd compare it to today. I guess it would be giving things, I guess, your possessions. So he looks around his herds because that's what people lived for back then was their herds. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, and the list goes on. He's finished up compiling a list of about 550 animals that he's sending to Esau as a gift. Shows you how much he must have had to, to be able to give that. So then he sends these gifts and he, he splits them all up with servant in front of each one to, to try and appease Esau and, and say to him, well, look, these are yours. I'm your servant. I'm, I'm here. I'm not a threat. I don't plan to be. I don't want anything. All I want to do is come back home. He did everything in his power to make the situation right. But things still weren't sitting easy with Jacob. And that night, after the, obviously the servants had left for their gifts, he was on the edge of, a, of the river. And he decides to send the family and the rest of, what, the rest of his possessions and everyone, send them over the river to, to camp for the night. But he himself decided that he would stay on the, on the other side. He wanted some quiet time. Time to get real with himself, I guess, and, and with God. And as he had this time, he realized that all these problems was because of him, because of his, what he'd done in the past. It was all coming back to, to get him. Isn't it sad through life when we, we go through life and, and things come up and, and things happen, and so at the last resort, when we often turn to God, and we often actually get really real with God and say to God, here I am, as I am, I need to turn it over to you. So 
So there he was, on his own. It was in a lonely mountainous region, the haunt of wild beasts and the lurking place of robbers and murderers. Solitary and unprotected, Jacob bowed in deep distress upon the earth. It was midnight. All that made life dear to him were at a distance, exposed to danger and death. Bitterest of all was the thought that it was his own sin which had brought this peril upon the innocent. With earnest cries and tears, he made his prayer before God. Just imagine it. You finally got to that place where you, there's nothing else to do. You've given up on every other possibility that you can come up with. You're having that time with God in, in solitude. It's about the middle of the night, and suddenly you're grabbed by somebody. I imagine his immediate thought would, is this Laban? deceived me again, coming back to get me, even though he's promised not to. Or maybe worse, it's Esau, and he's coming to get me, and then going to take my family. And Jacob starts the wrestling match of his life. And it's interesting to note, it doesn't state in the Bible, but in the um, spirit of prophecy, it says that nothing was said in this wrestling match. And I guess it's amazing, when you're going through something really traumatic or something amazing how things can go into slow motion. I've seen it before in like car accidents, and I've seen a few of them on the road, how things seem to go really slow, and you can actually replay things fraction of a second by fraction of a second, and it's, the whole incident is probably two or three seconds long, but you can actually play it out like half an hour replay, slow motion. And all of Jacob's life is going, he's replaying his life in his head. He learnt to hang on to God in that time. He was thinking that all this, what was happening, was because of what he'd done and replaying things over and over in his mind, thinking how if he had changed things, if he'd done things differently. And in verse 25, as daybreak approaches, the so called foe touches his hip, and his hip is dislocated. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was fighting with someone and it was life and death, you thought it was life and death, and someone did that to you, you would immediately, I know for me, I'd probably give up because it, your odds are suddenly stacked way on top of you. But you know, Jacob realized who he was wrestling with, realized it wasn't a man. And all of a sudden, the whole dynamics change because the stranger, so-called stranger, says, it's nearly daybreak, let me go. And he won't let go. And instead of warding off and, and fighting this person, now he is clinging to this person and saying, I will not let go until you bless me. He had poured out his life, and, and in God's mercy, God had reached out and, and touched him. And in that time, God changed his name from the deceiver to Jacob, the deceiver, to Israel, which means struggled with God and overcome. You see, all his life, Jacob had done things his own way. And I know, I do things my own way more than, more than not. He wasn't patient. Just going to help God out. That's why I needed to deceive God for the birthright. Oh, sorry, I've got to deceive my brother for the birthright. Hey, I've got to help God out. I've got to go in there and pretend I'm Esau so I can get it, get the blessing that was promised him. How often are we like that? I know I'm like that. But now he was ready to, to fully trust and accept God's bless, leading and timing and knowing that he had been forgiven. You know, at camp, we've just been down to family camp. And there's a, I learned a couple of things at family camp. 
which really stood out to me. I didn't get to spend a lot of time in the, in the senior one with the, with the grown-ups, like I probably should have been, but I was spending a lot of time with the, the teens and the youth, and, and they had a really good speaker. It was good to catch up with a lot of the teens from teen camp and, and just yeah, see, how, see how everyone's doing again. But one thing I learned is that God isn't fair. Don't have to throw stones yet. God isn't fair. I just want you to turn over to Psalms 103, verse 8 to, 9, uh, 8 to 11. Psalms 103, 8 to 11. God isn't fair. You'll see what I mean. Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great it is love for those who fear him. See, God isn't fair. If God was fair, I wouldn't be here today. I guarantee you that. If God wasn't fair, things would be way different than they are now. God is full of mercy, though. You know, as I look through the scripture, it occurs to me that Jacob isn't the only one who has wrestling matches. His, his one was a, a, a real physical wrestling match with God, but there's plenty others. You know, think of Samson. You know, when he had his head shaved and he a, he's a, spends that time walking around and around on that treadmill, blind. He's got time to wrestle with God. Work out what God's actual plan for his life was. And, it, and it's at that point that he became really useful for God. Asking for that strength back one more time to really show the, show the Philistines who God really was. David. Pleading and pleading and pleading, not eating or drinking for the, for the life of his child. Wrestling with God. Gideon. Spending time asking God, is this the right what you want me to do? Is this what you want? It doesn't seem right. It's pretty outnumbered. We're in pretty small odds. He was the weakest of the clan, of all the clans, the weakest member of his household, and yet God had a huge plan for him. Job. I can't imagine being Job myself. But Job had a wrestling match with God. It was a conversation with God, asking why, how. You know, and when we wrestle with God... I think in our culture we expect always to have good results. You see some of, those, some of these people through Scripture, some did have unbelievable results, like Gideon. But then you look at others like Samson or, or David, the results weren't what they at that time wished for. You know, we have all things that are important to us and that we wrestle with. I know here there's people here today that wrestle with sickness, illness, maybe employment. Maybe it's family members or family. Maybe it's loneliness, discouragement, fear. And we ask, because when, when we're down, we quite often ask, well, where is God in all this? Where, he, he seems far away. And the answer comes back, it's the same place he was when his son was on the cross. So close, so close. We must fear not, in Isaiah 41, verse 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And when we get down through Scripture, there's, we could spend all day looking at, at different characters of the Bible and, and when they wrestle with God. But if we go down into the New Testament, did Jesus wrestle? You bet he did. 
And if anyone I like to look at more, it's Jesus in his life. The ultimate example. And there's plenty of times we can look where Jesus wrestled. But the one in particular time was just before... Sorry, yeah, just before... Um, in Gethsemane, sorry. In Gethsemane. Just before the cross. Did he wrestle there? What was he wrestling for? To know the will of the Father. Did his wrestling take away the cross? Praise the Lord. No, it didn't. But you know what? It gave him the strength to carry on. Are we important to God? Isaiah 49, 15 and 16. Let's go just over the page. Isaiah 49, 15 and 16. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Is that possible? Pretty rare. Though she may forget, can a mother forget her child? I doubt it. Though she may forget, I, this is God, will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Are we important? We are engraved on his hands. You know, our world says, whatever you want, you can have and must have. And in this culture in, in New Zealand here, we're taught not to put up with inconveniences. And you see it, it starts generally on the road. You see people driving and people wave at you with some funny wave sometime when, you, when they think you've cut you off. And you don't see it more than when you're driving a truck. I tell you, it's, yeah. People just don't understand a truck and, yeah, they, they think you're trying to be funny or something, but... You know, this, this culture we live in, if something is inconvenient, we get rid of it or do something because we don't have inconvenience. I just heard yesterday in China, 500 million people are without jobs coming this coming week. They, had, they don't have social security. They don't have benefits. That's inconvenience. You know, we have a huge God. Amen to that? You know, we don't understand. I was watching this DVD I was telling you about before last night, and it was about space and, and how amazingly big it is. And we watched it down at camp too. It was a different one, but the same sort of thing. And it's just mind-blowing how big the universe and even this Milky Way galaxy, this little corner of the universe that we're in, this Milky Way, how vast and amazing it is. Everything is talks in is the speed of light. The speed of light travels at about 300,000 kilometers a second. So every second, it can go around the world seven times. That's the speed of light. Now in a year, because they tell everything's talked in a light year. So in one year, light will travel 9.46 trillion kilometers. Okay? So nine and a half trillion kilometers, that's one year. Our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, which is a dot compared to the, the universe, to get from one side of the Milky Way galaxy to the other will take you 100,000 light years. Okay? And they say that if you wanted to count every star that is in the Milky Way galaxy, and you counted one every second, one, two, it would take you two and a half thousand years to count every star in the Milky Way galaxy. And we're just a little corner, not even a corner. We're just, we're nothing. In First Kings it tells that the heavens cannot contain God. So God is even bigger than the universe. Amen? But you know what? He cares about this little solar system down here. And in the solar system we have our sun, which is reasonably big, on our scale. It's nothing in the scale of everything else. And on that sun, that sends some heat down. In eight minutes, the, the rays from the sun touch this earth. And luckily we're so far away from the sun because you wouldn't want to be at the sun's 
surface. In fact, I carry this pin. See this little pin here? And it's got a yellow head representing the sun. If the temperature of this pin was heated to the temperature of the sun's core, okay, you got that? The temperature of the sun's core, would we be alive in here? How far would that be reaching that would be unbearable? If this was heated to the temperature of the sun core, just that pin head. Everyone within a thousand mile radius would be consumed with the heat of that. So the people in Bacago would probably all of a sudden think it was quite warm. <laughs> we have an awesome God, a huge God, and yet in Matthew 10 verse 30, it tells me that, that God cares for me so much so that He doesn't even just know me, and He doesn't even know that I have hair on my head and doesn't know how many hairs I have on my head. He actually has them numbered. The hairs on my head are numbered. Do we have an awesome God? And you know, with this awesome God, there is nothing that we can do that can separate us from Him. I just want to turn over to Romans, and we close with this text. Romans 8, 38. Thirty eight and thirty nine. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, we need to learn to wrestle with God and really wrestle with God and not be afraid of God, not be afraid of what His answer might be, lean on, the, lean on the fact that when we wrestle with God, He has the whole world in His hands and yet He cares for us. He knows tomorrow, He knows this afternoon, He knows next week. He has a plan for each one of us and things might not be easy or rosy. He doesn't promise that He's going to make it easy or rosy either, like there's people around that tell you, oh, you come to God and He'll make everything sweet as. That's not for God. God says, I'll put my yoke on you. My yoke is easy. And that doesn't mean that it becomes light. It means that it's shaped just for you and that it's even pull with God. God will give you the strength to carry through. Let us learn to wrestle with God. Our last hymn this morning is, I'd rather have Jesus.
I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sick dread sweat. I'd rather have Jesus in anything this world affords today. He's fairer than lilies of rarest blue. He's sweeter than honey from out of the comb. He's all that my hungering spirit needs. I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead than to be the king of us Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are truly in a battleground. Lord, I just ask that we will learn to depend on you. We will learn to trust you. We will learn to wrestle with you, God. Wrestle with you so that we know what you'll have us to do, Lord. Lord, the devil throws some pretty mean curveballs, Lord. And I just ask for the strength to be able to stand, Lord. And Lord, while we have breath in our lungs, Lord, and a clear mind, Lord, I just ask that you will help us, Lord, to look for ways to serve you. And Lord, look forward to with hope to the day when you're coming again. We know that that day is so soon, Lord, and this world is nearly too tired, Lord. I just ask that we will hold on to that hope that we have in you and may others see a glimpse of that, Lord, and come to a relationship with you. I thank you and praise you for all that you do for us. In your name, amen.